Okay, friends, so um, I realize in having these conversations with friends and faculty and students and people that I respect, people I look up to that are in academia and other places, I realize that as a physicist, I have not had another physicist yet um, to have a conversation about how they're handling life right now in this crisis. And so I said, I have to rectify this. I, and there, there's a, a, a quite a few physicists that I know, um, quite a few that I'm very, very close friends with. And I thought, well, if there's one person who is very like-minded and a very similar personality with very similar interests to mine, um, this would be a great person, a great friend, and a great physicist to start uh, that sort of conversation with. So let's see if I can get her on the horn. I don't want to give any of the spoilers away. Um, let's see if we can get her on, and we'll go from there. Okay, it looks like we got you. Hi, Nicole. Hi. There we go. I had to unmute. <laughs> Perfect. So um, I just gave uh, I just gave a quick little spiel about you, but let me formally introduce you. So I'm very glad to be chatting with Nicole Granucci, who when I first met her, she was Nicole Di Nicola. Um, <laughs> and gosh, we have known each other for how long now? Probably 15, 16 years, maybe longer. Yeah, I think it's longer. I think it's longer. I think it's 18 years or something like that, because it was like in the 2000s that we met. Oh my gosh, time is, yeah. time, uh, okay. wow, okay, wow, yeah. we, have to, we have to have like a, an, an anniversary celebration of we that. <laughs> um, so N Nicole is, a, a, is one, of my, one of my dear friends, she's a close personal friend, um, we share a lot of mutual hobbies together, which I'm sure we'll discuss at some point, uh, you could probably see, the, see this in our, in our relative <laughs> backgrounds here. Um, but uh, Nicole is also a physicist. Uh, we spent some time in classes together. Um, Nicole was also one of my students at one point when I very when I first started teaching many many years ago. Um, and now she's a she's a both a, a a professor and a lab instructor at Quinnipiac University. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself, kind of how you got there, um, you know, and, and really what got you interested in the field of physics? Yeah. Okay. So um, let's start with how I got interested. Actually, um, it was in high school. It was like one of those stories, right? When um, I was taking physics. Uh, fun fact, I took physics, uh, not because I knew what physics was, uh, but I took it because all my friends were taking it. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, sure, I'll take physics. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and, you know, I really liked astronomy before I liked physics. Um, I was definitely one of those people that had their telescope out at night and was watching the lunar eclipse and researching cosmic questions. And um, so when I got to physics, um, it was a big surprise to me, to be honest, because I really enjoyed the mathematics. So I was always into mathematics um, and I was pretty natural at math. Um, I really enjoyed it. So I was like, oh, cool. Okay, this is math. And then all of a sudden, um, it was explaining all the how things worked. And mm -hmm. I just, that stuck with me. You know, I was like, wow, that's how, you know, that's, it wasn't so much, you know, it was like those everyday things. Like, oh, that's why the shower curtain always attaches to me. You know, like, those yes, little yes. Things. Or, you know, that's why, you know, when I rub, you know, the glass, um, it makes a sound, you know, those, uh -huh. that's what really got to me. And, um, and then I, I took physics, um, I took like the, the regular physics, um, and then I was like, I'm going to AP physics. And so, so you took <laughs> you took physics then before senior year, like was this a junior year or something? Junior, yeah. Wow, okay. okay. Yeah, so they, and my high school is a big high school, so we were all required to, um, not required to take physics, but it was very strongly suggested regardless okay. of who you were to take physics. Like almost everybody did. Okay. Um, it was a biology, chemistry, physics. And then you would take your upper level. I see. Um, okay. So I took AP physics my senior year. I actually took my chemistry my senior year too because I avoided the hard teacher <laughs> and waited uh, to do that. So um, then I took AP physics. And, you know, I was natural at it. I was not a natural student. You know, I think a lot of people think you have to be this natural physicist. And I wasn't, <laughs> but I enjoyed it. It didn't not, matter. Not this, not this one either. It's the <laughs> yeah. first thing I tell all my students. I say, I, I failed it the first time. I, well, I failed yeah. calculus the first time I took it. So they are yeah. not alone. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I tell them all that I struggled through physics, um, you know, and I, I, but I learned it, you know, and I, I tell them that, you know, it is a struggle and, you know, I definitely wasn't a natural at it. Um, but I remember going, I, you know, I liked, 
in high school, um, I decided to become a physicist because I actually like the teacher. Um, his name is Mr. Sweet, and I'm still in contact with him, and he's like my second dad. Um, he's like oh, wonderful. that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really, he actually got me the job at Southern that I had, you know, he's like, you, you got to be, you know, he got me into college, so that was really nice. Um, but yeah, so then, you know, physics, I was like, I could do this. I can teach physics and I could still learn about astronomy too. That was the other thing is like, I was really big into astronomy. I didn't know there was a connection. Right. Like, this, right. this is it, you know, and I took astronomy in high school, but it wasn't like, you know, the astronomy you wanted, you know. No, it never you, is. Right. Like when you take astronomy in high school, you think it's going to be like, oh, I'm going to learn about black holes and galaxies and you're learning about the earth's mantle. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's That's down there. I want to go up there. I know. I was like, this is important information. And I know, and it's like the solar system. And I mean, people who like astronomy know about the solar system already. So you're like, well, this wasn't what I wanted. So, right. <laughs> so yeah, no. you know. It's it's that, so uh, there's a couple of things in there that I, I find, I, I not only agree with, but I find interesting. Number one is, you know, it's funny, people sometimes take for granted how impactful what seems to be a relatively harmless decision can actually have for your future life, like taking physics because, well, my friends are taking it, so I'll take it too. And look at, <laughs> look at where it goes. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I, I always, I, I, you know, I say that I owe a lot of my life to some of the friends that I grew up with because you know, here I am now, I'm very proud of what I've accomplished. I'm very happy that I, you know, I've, I've been at a couple of different colleges, been department head a couple of times now, but it all started. I, I, I made the decision as to where to go to my undergraduate because I went where my friend was going. That was yeah. the only thing that went into my <laughs> thought process. Yeah. And, you know, obviously things changed once I got there. Right. Um, but, you know, some of these harmless decisions can really go a long way. The, the second thing is, you know, I, I think that a lot of physicists face this, too, is that we, we think astronomy is one thing. And then when we learn about it, it turns out to be something different. For me, I, I wanted to, you know, do and it's what I do now, right, the black holes and dark matter and galaxies and all that mm -hmm. stuff. I thought that was the astronomy stuff, right? But no, that's where the, really the physics is. The astronomy stuff is how you take the data about that, yeah. which, is, which could also be cool, too. Mm -hmm. But I definitely can't build those telescopes. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I can no. I can operate them okay, but <laughs> I want to I want to know about the, the the dynamics, the physics as to what right. goes on in these things. So it's really interesting that a lot of us say that same thing. Right? I, I know a lot of people that start out as someone who wanted to study astronomy and then find their way to physics. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a huge distinction too. You know, um, I did my master's in astronomy, not physics, astronomy. Well, it's optics. I did it in optics. Optics, but the okay, concentration. Yeah. Yeah, so the concentration was astronomy-based optics. So we learned about the image processing yes. of it, you know, and I'm really good. Well, I, I would say, <laughs> I would say really good, but I'm, I'm knowledgeable in how people take data and analyze it and how to make your image have better resolution. And the, when you are choosing the telescope that you want to take your images, which one you want to choose? and why and what right. wavelength and and all that where you know where where we were in college we took what like general relativity that was the physics of it though that, that was, was the physics that was learning about why you know and that was a great course because i learned it, it was way beyond me it was <laughs> like far beyond my capabilities but i learned so much in that course especially about black holes because i learned the mathematics behind it and i think that gives you more a, a better foundation of that so absolutely absolutely you know, that's a really cool thing so you you also mentioned about your you know your high school teacher in physics really inspired you and you, and you still stay close with this person um yeah i mean i think that also is another common story that i hear right is that i hear you know people that maybe they didn't pursue physics as a career like we did but people who are interested in physics always say well i had a great physics teacher but then right. 90% of the other people, again, if they took physics, they say my physics, my physics teacher in high school was terrible. And, and yeah. I really see this kind of this bimodal mm -hmm. thing happening, you know, it and is. so it really speaks volumes about the importance of a good high school physics teacher. It does. And you're funny, you know, you're totally right. Um, anytime I ask students, it's either they love their physics teacher or they hated their, there's not like, ah, oh, they're okay, you know. Or right. like, it's never okay. Yeah. No, it was just like, it was great or it wasn't, you know. Um, and it's just like, it's an interesting thing um, how the delivery of this subject really 
matters, you know, like, like you can either have this terrible experience or this wonderful experience. There's no gray area. <laughs> like, that's right. Um, that's right. I think that's part of it. What's important about our job, you know, like taking something that is hard and showing that it is attainable, you know, and I think a lot of students feel like, oh my gosh, physics, I don't know how to do this. Well, you're it's, in the right place because <laughs> that's what I'm going to teach you how to do. <laughs> that's right. How to do this. Now, I mean, I, I, I figured we were going to get there later, but since we're here now, I'll just, I'll, yeah. just jump, I'll just jump right into it because you and I have both taught, and I think you might even be currently teaching it or you've taught it very recently. You and I have both taught a course that has, kind of fuses the two of our interests, which is the physics of music. Um, I love teaching that course because of exactly what you had just said, right? I mean, that, that the presentation of this subject, that, that, that's what either makes people realize the power and the awe and the majesticness of the, all this, you know. And so physics and music is a wonderful interface for that because everybody loves music. You might not play it, you might not sing, you know, but I look at it as the perfect analogy, right? To me, everybody loves physics. They yeah. just might, they might, they might not know it yet, right? Yeah. Some of them, not many people are going to be a physicist, just like not many people are going to be a professional musician, right? But some people right. might watch the show on the BBC or might watch the show on Nova or read a book or something, right? They, they, they decide what level of involvement they want. The same thing happens with music. Everybody listens to it, but some might, you know, might pick up an instrument. Some might join a band. Some might take classes on it. Some might play in an orchestra or something, right? We, we have these same layers going on and there's a little bit of something in there, some insight for everybody, depending on which level you want to yeah. jump. So I, and I know you teach this class. So you, I'm assuming you probably feel similar. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you totally nailed it. And, um, you know, every time I teach this course, it's my favorite course to teach. I'm just going to flat out just say it because yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to definitely favor this, uh, because, you know, it's, here's a place where you can really take your, your personal interest and people love that too. You know, they love seeing you excited about something, but like you said, um, you can, you can impact their daily life and show them how, you know, even the simple thing of like beats, for example, or is present in your everyday life. You just don't know it. You know, you make, you get aware of your environment. And I think that's really important is awareness of, you know, how things work um, and, you know, help make decisions, you know, I mean, that's like another big thing. And, you know, um, I think that's really important. And, you know, physics and music is really fun with that. And plus it's very hands-on, you know, it's yes. a very, very you know, you can take a piano and you can find the frequency of it. You know, given our technology, we can do that. It's really fun. You know, I have a lab where we find the musical scale yeah. and we use a piano and we go through it. And I, I mean, the mathematics, like, you know, may not trigger some excitement with people, sure. but, but there is mathematics behind it. You know, it's, there's a reason for it. There's reasonings for all that. So well, I, th I think, again, even if it doesn't trigger something in people, I, I think, you know, Obviously, people like us are going to find it fascinating. But the first time you tell someone that, you know, oh, well, you can predict, mathematically speaking, what two notes are going to sound good together. They say, well, what are you mm -hmm. talking about? Well, why does a chord, why do we like yeah. these certain chords? And why do we like these certain harmonies and these other harmonies we don't? It's because they're all frequencies. And the way yeah. those frequencies as waves combine constructively or destructively, you can make predictions as to how this stuff is going to go. And when they see that oh, that forms the mathematical basis for a scale. Yeah, maybe they might not be inter yeah. as interested in the frequency intervals as we are, but right. the fact that it's there and the fact that Pythagoras found a good portion of this stuff thousands yeah. of years ago. <laughs> Pythagoras, I was so like mind boggled. I was like, of course he did. Of course he mathematically course. <laughs> determined the scale. Right, you know? way to go, A squared plus B squared, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. But like that, I mean, even that itself is mind blowing. Like this guy who we know as a mathematician, actually has a connection to music. I know. I know. Like... <laughs> yeah. I know. So I, I'm to totally with you. All right. So awesome. So, so that's, yeah. that's all some great background about you. Um, yeah. What do you do for fun? I know you have like a million and one hobbies, but what, what do you do for fun? <laughs> I think my, no yeah, I think my number one thing to do for fun is play music. Um, there's, there's no doubt with that. You know, I'm in my music room. Um, you know, if I, do a little tour you can kind of well my, my room is disgusting so just ignore it but there's my <laughs> piano and my uh, my string bass right there behind my piano is my trumpet my violin my clarinet saxophone you know flute all those fun things you know the stuff that everybody has laying around there yeah house, yeah right? you know i collect instruments people know that <laughs> so, 
and then, you know, I like it because, you know, I use them for demonstrations um, for my classes, but, more, you know, it, it's my outlet. It's my place where, you know, I just stop thinking because yeah. my mind is going all the time. I'm even thinking about emails right now that I should really need to answer, you know, I, like. Sorry, I'm getting in like, the way, I know. <laughs> no, no, you're not. You know, this is, this is important. But, you know, your mind just goes, right? And, and, and so it's like a yoga meditation for me, you know, in a sense, it's like, I could stop and think about how to sound and I'm not thinking about other things, you know, and yeah. I like, I like playing music that I know a lot, you know, so like, you know, my daughter's four, she's almost five and she likes, of course she likes Frozen. So of course I learned the Frozen songs on the piano. Yeah. How can you not? Fun. Exactly. But then, you know, I have my musical interests. So I play everything from rock to classical and, you know, some days I'm feeling classical and, some days I'm feeling, you know, like Enya. You know, some days I'm feeling, you know, uh, you know, Radiohead. You know, it just depends you know, on my mood and my. And then half the time I just make stuff up. You know, yeah. I just play my piano and I don't have a goal. And then that's okay. You know, I just don't want to do anything. I just want to play music, think about how things sound, and and just like sometimes I record it, sometimes I don't, and right. that's like what I do on the piano. Um, so that's what I mean. You know, I play the electric bass, actually. Fun fact. We play together. Actually, I should point this way. No, this the, way. There you go. Right, There's whichever way we are. Yeah. Let's I know. That. I was like, which way are we? <laughs> you know, um, you know, before all this fun stuff happened, you know, we um, play in a cover band. Um, so I play electric years bass. Years now. Yeah. Years. And, you know, um, how should I call you, Dr. O'Brien? <laughs> James, come on, my goodness. James, I know, I call him James. That's the way I call him. I, I don't know how professional we want it. But anyway, we are in a cover band, so that's a really great outlet to, you know, um, just being able to play music with, with people, you know, and I think, you know, as much as I love playing by myself, um, this is my team sport, you know, this is, I love playing with people. I love that interaction when we play with people how our parts come together, yeah. um, how we make something together. Absolutely. I think that's just awesome. <laughs> ah, that's great. All right, so yeah. that's, that's a lot of good information. So hopefully you're gonna share some of this with your students. What do you think would be something um, about you that they don't know currently that you think they might find interesting? We've already covered a lot of interesting yeah. things. Yeah, I think don't know about me. Um, thinking about this I don't know if I have a great answer for that I would say um they know a lot about me <laughs> very personal in my class yeah you know yeah. they let's see they know that I have a daughter and she actually appears in my lessons very often so that makes sense you know <laughs> and I have a son you know and I play music um I think what do they not know about me oh here's one they might not know that you have the fortunate thing that you can share one of your favorite hobby, hobbies, not just with friends like me, but you also get to share it with your husband. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So my husband, that's a good point. So my husband, well, my is also a musician as well. Um, he plays drums, which is very important in a cover band. And uh, he plays guitar. You can see my guitars in the background. Um, so he plays guitar and he plays drums. Um, my husband's like my best friend. So we do a lot of things together. In fact, we're very very close. Um, we do everything from playing music together. Um, we like to exercise together. We both do yoga. We both um, we both like to play video games and games together. I just got Final Fantasy VII, the new remake. Oh, um, yes. Good. Oh, my God. I'm so excited for that. <laughs> like, you don't have a lot of time to dedicate to it, so it's going to be a long one. But I say, be careful when you jump right in, because that's when the sleepless nights will start, you know? It's already started, James. <laughs> it's just like up till midnight last night, because I started at 11, you know, of mind course. you when the start time is, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's like midnight, and I'm fighting the first boss, and, you know, <laughs> so I guess that's another thing, because I'm a gamer, um, you know, I play a lot of video games. Well, I used to play video games. I don't play them as much, um, and I play a lot of board games now. That's a thing that I like to do. I play yeah. everything. Um, board games, D&D. &D, we do our D&D &D sessions, too. Um, I haven't done a lot lately, but, yeah, total gamer. <laughs> yeah. So, how, so, I mean, you, you're a lot like me. You, you have a lot of outlets. You're a very personable person. You like to be around other people. How are you handling what's going on both personally and you know, professionally, interacting with your students, et cetera? 
horrible <laughs> to be honest. I mean, this is this is hard. Um, I'm very, I'm a little bit of like I, mean, I have my little introvert self, you know, which appreciates the time. But yes. I'm a very, I like people. I like hanging out with people. I like interacting with my students. I miss them. I tell them, <laughs> I miss their faces. Yeah. Um, this social isolation is really hard. Um, you know, especially my family, very close. So I'm getting teary, you know. Yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. But it's true. It's 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 hard. It's yeah. you know, it's totally different. It's totally something we haven't experienced. So we don't know how to how to work through it. <laughs> yeah, and you're you're in an interesting place too. So I know that you've taught online classes before, right? But that, that's different. Like, you know yes. what you're getting into oh, yeah. when you sign up for that. Yes. And, and you're in an interesting place because you, this, this is now your first complete year at Quinnipiac, right? And, and part of that year got uprooted by this, by this thing. How is that, how has yeah. that affected the students and, and, and you? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, like you said, you made a great point. I mean, it's different. Um, I've taught, like you said, I've taught online before and I have a plan for that, you know, and how I execute things with a plan on my course is different than what I'm doing now. Right now, I'm just working through a crisis. Um, I'm making it as, I'm trying to make it as manageable for both me and my students, you know, so, um, you know, one of the things I'm doing is trying to make it, um, well, I make it as, um, asynchronous, so I post my videos on YouTube, um, you know, it's, it's me, you know, I try, I put my face on it, so I don't want just like a whiteboard and someone right. talking. Right, right. So it's always me in a corner at the bottom yeah. <laughs> and I do that on purpose. So it's me talking to them and I try to be as silly and goofy and, you know, as possible to be human. Um, and then we meet every week and I check on them, you know, like how you doing? You have any questions? Let's go over what we're going to do. Yep. Um, and we do a face to face um, with that and make it, you know, people, people have problems. They can't hand in their homework on time. That's fine. I'm right. not worrying about it. Right. I'm just, if you can't do it, you can't do it. I get it. So and I'm being that, very lenient. That's been a common theme of everybody that I've talked to is that, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's priorities here, right? I mean, like homework, yeah. you know, like de deadlines have a little bit looser. I mean, obviously we can't sacrifice the content, right? But no, but, no. but de deadlines, you know, I mean, this is, this is something that nobody expected. It's not no fault of us on the faculty side and no fault on the, side of the student. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard for everybody, and everyone has their own struggle. You know, it's hard for me. Um, it's hard because I have my daughter and constantly barraging me, and she needs her attention, and I give it to her because she needs it. Yeah. You know, and so that leaves me no time to do a lot of things, including my work. <laughs> it, seriously, I mean, what happens is most of my most of my day, I I meet my classes, and you know, and then it's a lot of just hanging out with my family and making sure they're comfortable, and then when I have a free time. Uninter uninterrupted time, a couple hours a night is where I do my, right. my most work. Yeah. And it's what I can do. And, and it's hard. And it's hard for my students. My students are having a hard time. A lot of them haven't done online before. So yeah. they're losing it, understandably. They don't know how to submit some things. I mean, they have Blackboard experience. Does, do you use Blackboard too? We use a similar product called, similar. Um, called, called Brightspace. You know, they're all, yeah, all they're, those yeah. elements are going to be similar. So. Yeah, exactly. So same thing. And, you know, but even like, um, even when I was talking, so I, I manage a bunch of adjuncts who teach the labs too. They, um, they needed a tutorial. How right. do you upload assignments? How do you do this? You know, uh, video. How to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, luckily I have background in it and I'm pretty versed in, you know, technology. So I'm, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with it, but um, it's hard for, you know, I don't know what my students are going through, what Wi-Fi connections they have or don't have, if they have to take care of their family, right? they're sick. I told them if I don't hear from them in two weeks, you know, I'll check in on you um, just to check in. But, you know, um, don't feel like if you get sick that you need to email me because you're going in the hospital and you're worried about your life. Stop that. <laughs> I think that's the most important thing right now. Right. You know, and <laughs> right. Just, you know, just, you know, if you can, you know, at some point keep me in the loop, um, you know, but, you know, don't, you know, don't lose connection with me. I'm here to right. help, you know. So, you know, they're struggling too. And I think, you know, and it's hard. I've done online classes personally. They're three times as hard, hard. because you are doing all the learning by yourself. Yeah. 
no matter how much I'm talking to a screen, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, and, and like you said, I keep going back to it, especially when it's not what you signed up for, either on the faculty side or the student side. Like when you, if you're enrolling for an online course or you're getting ready to teach an online course, like, you know, you know the landscape is going to look this certain way. But we were in this crazy scenario where everybody in this boat signed up for X and then it got completely shifted. The, the, the ground moved beneath us and there was nothing we can do. Yeah. Yeah. So, let, so let me let me ask you then, um, you know, in an ideal world, right, you know, uh, pandemic clears tomorrow, right, we all kind of yeah. go back, at least not just with the time that we had, but the brain space that we have, you know, what what things about physics, astronomy, what do, what do you think is going to be great or the recent discoveries that are happening right now? Or what are you looking forward to in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Like what keeps you that drive to stay oh, interested? Oh, the James in the Space Telescope. Yeah. James Webb Space Telescope is a big, 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 um, you know, upcoming event in astronomy, which I'm looking forward to. I mean, there's going to be some great science coming from that. Um, I know they're going to do the big telescope in Hawaii. Um, mm -hmm. At least they're still on track for it. I know there's a lot of controversy for that, um, but I'm also excited about that if it goes through. Because again, another big chunk of science will come from that. I mean, we got the, the, the Gaia database just came out. I mean, the there's just so much data coming out right now. There's almost and too just, much data from Gaia. I've tried to, <laughs> I've tried to like, like scratch the surface on it. There's just so much. Yeah, and it's you know um, some of my friends and colleagues that work at um, you know various different places so like like Caltech and JPL and all that stuff. They're just trying to dive into it too. I mean, there's just so much data out there. I mean, we're I think you're a pretty exciting time in science in terms of astronomy, especially with you know. Some of the data that's coming out and some of the new science i mean right now like exoplanets are just like popping up every day it's like yeah before it was like oh my gosh an exoplanet that's like uh, exoplanets we got it you know <laughs> it's just like <laughs> but that's the, that's the exciting part is that we're learning so much more about our expanded universe and there's just so much more out there i mean there's so many more moons of jupiter i mean not even it was exciting you know like the 88 or whatever they found recently right so i think I think also with the um, social media, I think astronomy is taking a bigger uh, audience now. People are getting moon this month, but lately people are like, oh, you know, is this the special moon? You know, is it bigger? Why is it bigger? You know, right. is it is it uniquely special? I'm like, not really, but I'll tell you why, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, so there's, I think a lot of social media has brought excitement to the topic. You know, obviously right now it's, it's, it's not on the table for anything, but, you know, we have some other exciting things coming up in astronomy. Um, I'm looking forward to the trip to the moon again. Um, you know, of course, Mars is another, another um, major thing that's going to happen. But, I mean, there's just so much. I mean, with the reusable rockets, I mean, pretty soon space travel will be commercial. I can't, ima I can't, I can't imagine it. Right. Like it's just exciting stuff and, you know, it's, and it's happening everywhere, you know, um, you know, it's, even at Southern Connecticut, there's some really good science happening there and in astronomy and making things more attainable. And um, so it's just like, it doesn't have to be, you know, I think a lot of people think astronomy has to happen at NASA or some big facility and no, it's happening in our backyards, you know, it's happening around us. It's close. You know, and I think it's that's another good, important thing. I think that's a good message. And, you know, maybe, maybe when times like this happen, right, and your social bubble and your kind of world becomes a lot smaller, who knows, maybe this might lead to some people turning to other interests that they might have had or maybe didn't have time to pursue. And even if it's just going out in the backyard and like laying on the grass, like at least the weather is getting to where yeah. you can do that now and being like, hey, you know, so much more out there than that we don't know about. Yeah, there is. And like you could honestly go through data and discover some more exoplanets on your own. You know, look at some light curves and <laughs> yeah. transit data, and you can discover your own exoplanet. One one of my you colleagues got time you got some time. That's right. One 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 of my colleagues is is uh, using hypersensitive data from light curves and um, using that to to figure out pretty good estimates of what not only you know the mass and stuff of these exoplanets and distances but also what their atmospheres are like that's where that's we so are cool. now like, yeah we, that's we can talk about oh like that that hot jupiter has is made up of this much methane this it's it's 
the fact that we can right. know that and, and we're know. clearly never going to get to that planet in our lifetime, right? This is, this is amazing, you know? That is amazing. I didn't know they got to atmosphere conditions already. <laughs> I mean, there, there's still there's still yeah. some debate as to like yeah. whether whether it that whether what they claim they're looking at is that leading order or not. But it seems like all signs are pointing like if it's not that, then it's got to be something very closely related. So, yeah, you know, um, when I went to my last astronomy conference I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, one of the best things I want to to understand, of course, understanding our climate is very important, but understanding our climate is important for understanding planetary climate. And they were studying um, the Earth's, um, they were studying like the Earth's, I don't remember the exact thing, but it was like the Earth's um, glacier trends because they were looking at glacier trends on other planets. I was like, oh, yes. That's so cool because yes. climate would be, you know, if, if you go to another planet, you do need to know the climate. What are the changes? You know, you don't want to colonize another planet and then like, oh, we're going through an ice age right now. <laughs> you know, like that's a yeah. big. <laughs> I, 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 I can't give away some of the specifics because it's proprietary data from one of my friends who, who is in that field in, in, Ooh, in okay. planetary research, but it'll be coming out in the next couple of months. But the, the, the gist of it is, is that, when you study the glaciers that are on uh, Mars in terms of asking the question as to did Mars have oceans and if so, how deep were they? Um, it's an interesting question. You know, you think, okay, so it had water, big deal. But the more interesting question is that, well, how much water it had and how deep it was gives you some really good information about the atmosphere, the way that it was and the way that it is and the cross section mm -hmm. of how that atmosphere does its job. Uh, I bring this up because they made some recent discoveries that there was way more water on Mars than we ever thought that was there. Um, cool. And now the interesting thing is that you get to that conclusion based on a certain calculation about the cross section of the dispersion of the heat in the atmosphere. But that has tremendous ramifications when we talk about the global warming uh, impact here on Earth. And so I don't want to give, a, give it away, but it's amazing how, yeah, studying some other planet can give you some really interesting information about the one that we live on here. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that's a lot of, you know, a lot of people, I think, have that misunderstanding is that why are we studying other, other planets? We care about what's here. It's like, no, do you understand that the other planets are like snapshots in time of other periods and other points of Earth? You know, we learn so much about Earth from other planets. So That's right. It's very important. So, you know, NASA, keep funding it. <laughs> <laughs> and other things, you know, and other scientific research and astronomy, because it's not just NASA. It's like I said, it's our back, it's our college and universities that are doing this research too. Um, and we need that funding because it, we learn more about ourselves. Absolutely. So I have to get ready to go to another class in a minute. But before we part ways for today, I just want to ask you uh, real briefly. So, you know, advice for your students and advice for other faculty that are going through this right now. What's your message you want to send to them? Uh, for my students, I would say, honestly, um, it's, this is hard. Um, and, you know, finding your way is difficult, but you'll find a way. Things may not be as perfect or as, as the quality that you want it to be, but let it go. You know, just get what you need to get done. And it will, you know, I can't predict the future, but you know, we're gonna look back on this and think about what we did and what we could accomplish from it. So I think, you know, I think you need to be kind to yourself, um, kind to others, especially to others too, um, because they're also struggling as well. Um, but I think, you know, besides all that struggle, you will get through it. You will get through it and it will be, it will be. Awesome. That's the thing. It will be. Um, you'll do it. You have support. That's the other thing. You have support. Um, for yeah. faculty that are teaching as well, I think it's the same message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Honestly, know. Honestly, I think, you know, <laughs> it's true. It's true. You know, I think, you know, I think right now we need to be kind to ourselves. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a perfect, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist because I'm definitely not perfect. But I always have this high standard and you know what? It doesn't need to be that high right now. You right. don't need the best of the best. You need to get the basics and that's what you need. 
and um, be supportive to each other. Um, make sure you're reaching out to help each other out if you need help and to be kind to yourself and to others, including your students, you know, giving them the, giving them the help that they need, looking out for them and we're on it together. That's a great message, but I got one more for you because I know that we, sh we, we share one other, one other similar fascination. Um, where do you think this season is going in Westworld? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I am so excited about the storyline. Can we talk, are we going to really talk about this? Because I'm going to go we, we, into we, we, this. Yeah. We, we, yeah. <laughs> right, oh, just short. You saw the like, fourth episode, right? You're, you're caught up. Oh God, how can I not be? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How can I not be? Okay. So I just loved right now um, the interaction with Bernard and Caleb. And Bernard asks Caleb, do you know, you know what, do you, he asked him, are you one of us? Uh -huh. And I think that was such a pivotal moment. And then it made, I think it really opened up to Caleb, do you know why you're with that person, you know, or doing what you're doing? And that to me was a huge interaction, you know, with the two of them. Um, and I'm just really loving um, Caleb's story and, and how, you know, I, I don't know what to feel about him. And I think that's really excited, you know, like, you know, um, I, I'm really interested to hear more about his backstory with his friend. Yep. Um, you know, I think that's really important right now. Bernard is amazing. I mean, he's just always a great. He's character. always been. I mean, he's the acting from that from that that actor has just always been phenomenal. Yeah, and like Maeve, I'm excited about Maeve. Um, you know, she's got an interesting story too. And I'm I'm actually I think the one of the biggest things I'm I have a question about is about um, Dolores. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see why she, I know that she feels very closed in, you know, and she wants humanity to see that they're closed in too. Mm -hmm. But uh, my question is, is that the right thing to do? I love that question, you know. Um, does this lead to more, is this the right thing to do? I love that. Well, it it depends on the age. end. It, it depends on your motivation, right? I mean, if her motivation is for humanity's sake, it's still a difficult question, right? It's the ignorance yeah. is bliss argument, right? You know, if you, yeah. do, do you wake someone up to the fact that something that they're doing is poisonous or destructive? Do you wake someone up to the fact that, you know, the thing, the path they're on leads to destruction or do you let it go? In one way, you could say you're saving some people or you're showing them reality, but certain people that you can make the argument then don't want to see reality, right? It's, it's the matrix slash ignorance is the, the blue pill versus red pill problem all over again. Right. Yeah, so I'm really, and that's really fascinating that they, you know, technology has gone to that point, right? Like where they're predicting, you know, who or what people are, you know, and that to me, I mean, just the world, the world that Westworld is, it is, it's self fascinating. I Absolutely. Just love, love the world aspect of it, like where technology has taken us and, you know, the degree of robot and, you know, I loved, you know, another interaction, the Caleb robot interaction with his like robot came to help him kind of thing. Yep. I love that because it shows the vulnerability of robots, you know, and I just, I don't know. I, I think the, what's I think, going on? I think to me, the, the world that they've, that they've constructed is to me, one of the most intellectually stimulating per playgrounds, right? Because there's so many ideas and topics uh, and so many abstractions that even if, so there's definitely that top layer, but then as like, like any other good thing in a philosophical question, right? As you run with them, whether the writers intended this or not, it leads you to a whole second layer. So some really interesting, you know, ethical, phenomenological and metaphysical mm -hmm. constructs that um, I think that the landscape that they've painted is, is one that I've never expected to get from a TV show. And so I'm super excited about it. I know it's just they did such a good job of thinking about everything you know what is this world like you know what is you know where where is humanity here you know like I love that yeah. you know Even the like question said, is is it in a good place or a bad place yeah it's just and like the, the the crazy part is we're getting to that point you know this is like 
you know, social status, all that, the black mirror stuff too, you know, <laughs> like it's yep. just, it's those glasses where it shows you information. I mean, that's not far away or the concept right. of self-driving cars or, you know, I mean, this is our, the future, you know, like, I mean, Star Trek and, um, what else? Like, what was it? Star Trek and like the Simpsons predicted a lot of technology <laughs> that That's actually right. is reality now. I know. Which is great. <laughs> and this is that you next know? step. So you know, this, some of this might is. be here in our lifetime. It is, in, including some of those hard questions, you know, like, will there be a, a theme park with, you know, robots and will that exist? You know, I mean, they, I think they took it to the, the fictional point, but maybe we're not so far away from that fiction, you know, yeah. development and, of AI and um, where it's going to go. So I, I just love that outlook. Like, the, the, to bring this back to physics, the thing that I find interesting is that, you know, if we rewind to like the time of the Manhattan Project, right? You know, the Manhattan Project happened with a sense of urgency because we had to get something done. That in that urgency, we really didn't have the time to separate the physics and the engineering of doing it, um, to separate that from the ethics and the philosophical side as to what was actually being done. And then it happened, and now we're dealing with, we are still dealing with the fallout of what that means today. On the flip side here with the AI and potentially robots Westworld type question, at least for decades, right, science fiction has been writing about this and computers have been getting better and better, so much so that I think even ordinary people that are not in these fields can see that this stuff is probably coming. Um, and so I feel like society as a whole has had a long time to ask these questions and to start thinking about what this might look like as an eventuality. And so I find some comfort in that, right? As opposed to just diving yeah. in like, okay, here it is. Now let's yeah. deal with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is a really good point. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's interesting and alarming to see where, you know, where our technology goes and how it, how it can change. But the, I mean, the good news is that, you know, we're nowhere near that <laughs> in, in right. terms of that, you know, right. um, you know, it's, it's, you know, one of the things I was reading, um, and I know you have to go, but, um, you know, it was really interesting is like, you know, how we would terraform another planet. And one of the ideas was to use robots because, right. Who cares, you know, in a sense. Who cares, right? right. Who cares? Because, yeah. you know, because they can go to a, a different environment. They don't have to worry about what they're breathing and, you know, how they're interacting with the environment. They can go and build, you know, a whole city all by themselves. But is that labor, you know? Like, then you ask those ethical questions. Like, you send a bunch of robots to go build something on an unknown planet. Is that the right thing to do, you know? I know. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, <laughs> we can make five other videos on that question that's alone. That's I know, I know, <laughs> but I know you have to go. Um, well, thank you, Nicole. I, I'll give you a shameless plug. If you ever uh, feel the need to post it to YouTube, um, I, I may or may not have heard you uh, do a wonderful piano performance of the Westworld theme song. And so uh, if, if you ever put that on there, I'd be happy to put a link below for your students and my students to check that out. Um, or if you send me a link to sure. your, your YouTube um, uh, physics lessons, you know, maybe you might have a better way of explaining some of the stuff to my students. Um, and so, you know, the more we're sharing that information, I'd be happy to put that yeah. at the bottom of, the, of this video as well. Likewise, that's a great idea. I would love to collaborate. So yeah, um, same thing. Um, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll be happy to give you um, links um, to my YouTube channel, which is all physics and a little bit of my daughter, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then <laughs> mostly physics though. Um, and then yeah, I can I, I have that Westworld clip. I'll have to find it, but yeah. <laughs> Good. So put it up there. Well, I'll put both in the description. But Nicole, thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, doing some version of this next week, but with the guitars instead of talking about physics. Sound good? Yes. That sounds great. Thank you for having me. This was great to, to touch base with people and to talk. And I really loved our conversation. Thank you. <laughs> great. Thanks, Nicole. Have a great day. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.